On Tisky Sour, we spent most of April reporting on Britain's coronavirus catastrophe. However, there was one political story we just had to cover. The Labour leaks. They were a set of documents compiled by Labour Party staff about how the former leadership in Labour Party HQ had undermined Jeremy Corbyn. This included sabotage, it included bullying, all quite shocking stuff. On the 13th of April, myself and Aaron Bastani went through the documents in detail. We can join the conversation as we discuss one particular WhatsApp chat. This was a chat between members of the party's senior leadership team just after the surprisingly positive exit polls came out in the 2017 general election. Patrick, if anyone in War Room needs some safe space time, they can come to GSO, so the General Secretary's office. Tracy Allen, more like in need of counselling. Um, Emily Oldno, who, as we said, is Executive Director for Governance, Membership and Party Services. What's the atmosphere like there? Simon Mills, depending which side of the building. Patrick Kennigan, who is in charge of the election campaign. Awful. Help. Um, Simon Mills, <laughs> split between euphoria and shock. Oh, I don't need to read you all the names. Julie Lawrence, we are stunned and reeling. Tracy Allen, they are cheering and we are silent and grey faced. Probably the best line in the chat. Opposite to what I had been working towards for the last couple of years. So this is a chat of people with top jobs in the Labour Party. And they're explicitly saying they have been working for the last couple of years to make sure Labour never do well in a general election. Um, Emily Old, no, we have to be up deep, upbeat and not show it. And at least we have loads of money now. Julie Lawrence, not if we go into a coalition and lose short money. Steve walking the floor. Duh, 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 duh. Patrick Hannigan, I'm going into room of death. Ian McNichol, it's going to be a long night. Aaron, what do you what do you make of this? The people who were, you know, getting paid quite handsome salaries by mm. the Labour Party. Mm after the exit poll results from a general election come in where we have surprised where the labor party have performed surprisingly well phenomenally well um a 10 point increase from 30% in 2015 yeah. to 40% in 2017 against all expectations yeah i mean what do you make of it that this was the reactions of two executive directors and other people with high-powered positions in the Labour oh, yeah. Party and the General Secretary. Yeah, the General Secretary and two directors. Like the, These are, bear in mind, all these WhatsApp conversations are from what's called the SMT group, the Senior Management Team group. This should be the most senior group of people in the Parliament, uh, in, in the Labour Party, outside the Parliamentary Labour Party, of course. The two other people there that haven't, their titles have not been given, they were working in Ian McNichol's office. What you see in those conversations is effectively a parallel structure, a party within a party, revolving around Aldno, Hennigan, Elsewhere, John Stolliday and also Ian McNichol and, and Tom Watson. This was a, a party within a party. Uh, if we can go back to the first, uh, the first bit of that conversation, okay, uh, you can see as Michael's already said, awful help. Tracy Allen is uh, one of the people who works in the um, uh, in the McNichol office. She's saying opposite to what I've been working towards for the last couple of years. Uh, we have to be upbeat and not show. Now this is critical. This is really critical. Emily Old now is now at Unison. She's um, an assistant general secretary there. Uh, she has been widely tipped as Keir Starmer's number one choice to be the, part, the, the, the Labour Party's general secretary to replace to replace uh, Jenny Formby. Uh, and you can see what she says here. We have to be upbeat and not show it. Uh, there's a, a level of dissimulation and, and lies, fundamentally, which is quite remarkable. And then she looks at the upside. At least we have loads of money now. And I, I, we're going to have to disagree about this, perhaps, Michael. This is the worst line for me. Julie Lawrence, not if we go into coalition and lose short money. Julie Lawrence, who works for Ian McNichol, is explicitly stating that the worst possible thing that can now happen is for the Labour Party to enter government. Her colleague says, well, the upside is we have more money. She goes, no, well, no, we won't have more money because we'll lose the short money because we'll be in government. Why are all these people working for the Labour Party if they don't want the Labour Party to be in government? Why are MPs in Parliament for Labour if they don't want to be MPs in a governing Labour Party? Why are people canvassing on doors, knocking on doors, paying money to travel around the country, taking time off, working unpaid to get people elected to change the policies uh, of this country? Why, why are we doing all of this stuff? I mean, I was canvassing for Labour in 2017. Uh, uh, why, why are people doing all of this if actually the people at the very top don't want to win? I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. And um, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. Yeah, the media have not really picked. I mean, they're having to because it's just such a huge story. Uh, I saw some of the comments when I said it's really blown up. Not many stories on the Navarro Media site get, you know, around 200,000 views in about 24 hours. It's a it's a big story. And, that, and when something's that big, 
coupled with, of course, as we were talking about people, you know, sharing screen grabs and so on through WhatsApp, you can't measure how big that gets. Uh, we have no idea because it's all, it's all private channels. Uh, that is a fundamentally terrifying story of the party of opposition and the people running it not wanting to actually be the government. That is anathema to our entire democratic system. It's a huge, huge scandal, and it's so big, inevitably, eventually, uh, the people who will never want to cover these things because they're embroiled with these very same people are going to have to cover it because it's a, a story of fundamental national significance. Well, also, I mean, as I, as I was saying earlier, like we, even at the time, so this is all happening in, in 2017, at the time during that general election, we'd be talking on Navarra Media about how, you know, there was internal civil war going on in the party and we're not sure if the if the people in HQ are really going to be working towards the party's interests. That was called a bunker mentality, conspiratorial. Um, you know, how dare you question the motives of party staff? Um, and we should have a look at as well how these people were covered by the media at the time. Um, because whilst these people, it seems, were actively working to undermine Labour's electoral chances, they were still presented as the most important people in the party who were the, you know, the only ones keeping the show moving um, and you know, making it electorally competent, even though they were you know, working in the opposite direction. I just want to go to one of the worst examples of this. As this is about Emmy Old, no, you've seen the, the quotes um, at the time. She left the party in 2018 to become to work at Unison. Potentially, people are saying she might come back as Keir Starmer's pick for general secretary. I imagine these revelations will well, probably make that much more difficult than it would have been. Um, but this is Kevin Schofield at Politics Home. Fresh blow for Labour as senior official dubbed brains of the party quits. And the subheading, a senior Labour official dubbed the brains of the party has dramatically quit her job. Senior party sources said Miss Oldno's decision to quit was a hammer blow for Labour. One told Politics Home, this is the brains and the muscles of the organisation leaving. That's it for the Labour Party. So this is someone... This is someone who, after the general election, when we did quite well, was saying we have to pretend to not be incredibly miserable so that people, you know, don't have proof that we actually wanted the party to lose. That's it for the Labour Party. Actually, these people leaving the Labour Party was necessary, and I would say one of the best things that happened to it. But obviously, it didn't go that well afterwards. But they were they were one of many things holding holding back the party at this point in time. Well, can I just say before we carry on, you're saying it didn't go well afterwards because as we we'll, as we as we'll see. I actually feel sorry. One of the things as I was going through this report and writing the piece, I feel sorry for the People's Vote campaign because what it became was a lifeboat. Actually, I think two people for all from of these this, people, yeah. yeah. Patrick Hannigan went to the People's Vote. Yeah, campaign. a couple of the, I think John Soledad as well. Maybe that may not be correct. I think it was John Soledad. It was a couple of them. And you know, these are talentless, malicious, horrible people. And they actually made the People's Vote campaign, you know, inevitably about just undermining Jeremy Corbyn and, and destroying Labour in any general election. And I feel so sorry for people that really believed it was about a second referendum. I'm sure many people involved in it were, were involved because of those reasons. But it became a lifeboat for apparatchiks, effectively, who were now no longer provided with a career by the Labour Party, who wants to earn a living. Uh, and they did so by fundamentally de destroying this destroying this movement. It was a movement. The, the movement for a second referendum. I didn't support it because I didn't think the electoral calculus added up. But look, it's a democracy. People can do what they like. But the the individuals at the top of that who are also involved in this, people like Patrick Hennigan, my God. So Patrick Hennigan went on to be director of the People's Vote campaign. John Stolliday was head of strategic communications until March 2009 when he moved to Unison. So that Philip Schofield article also contained what was Emily Oldno's uh, email to all staffers. The political books and newspaper clippings rarely mention the heroic efforts of party staff who each day go to work with one simple objective, to help secure the election of a Labour government. That is not the objective you went to work with. You went to work with the objective to save a few right-wing MPs from losing and were incredibly disappointed when Labour had the chance potentially to form a government. Another party insider said, politicians may grab the headlines, but it's Emily and her team who have kept the show on the road the last few years. Difficult to see where the party goes next. These were people who wanted the Labour Party to lose. Difficult to see where the party goes next. Jesus Christ. Well, we know where they wanted it to go next, which was they wanted to carry on what they'd already done, uh, except rather than pissing inside the tent, they'd have to do it outside the tent. Mm. In the case of the two gentlemen we talked about who went on to work for uh, the People's Vote campaign. So Lucy Fisher is um, at the Times or Sky, is she? Times. I think defence defence correspondent. 
Major departure from Labour, Exec Director Emily Oldno has quit ahead of new GenSec, likely to be Jenny Formby appointment. Senior party sources say it's a massive loss and predict she won't be the last to go. Oldno was key moderate who oversaw HR and compliance. This is one thing you want to take out of this entire story is that journalists on your Twitter feed with blue ticks, people that write in the newspapers, many people that go on television. I mean, there are some exceptions. Sky broke the stories, as I've said, uh, but many of them are actually like Kevin Schofield. Many of them are the last people you should trust in terms of maintaining journalistic integrity. All right, let's go to the bit of, about racism and bullying, because this is I mean, this, I think this is what shocked people most on, on Twitter, as well as, you know, obviously party staff trying to actively undermine the electoral chances. These, these were the most shocking. Um, so Mulholland as PLP secretary was the main liaison between MPs and the Labour Party. In February 2017, she said, Diane Abbott literally makes me sick. In the same WhatsApp group, senior staff discussed, discussed Abbott crying in the toilets and telling Michael Crick, a Channel 4 reporter at the time, where she was. Um, and now let's go to their WhatsApp chat. Patrick Hannigan. Abbott found crying in the loose. Julie Lawrence, a sort of crying emoji. Tracy Allen. Abbott Memorial Cupboard works well. Um, Patrick Hannigan. Diane in Leon on Vic Street. Fiona Stanton. Shall we tell Michael Crick? Patrick Hannigan. Already have. Uh, so this is someone, he's an executive director of the Labour Party who is telling people the location of Diane Abbott um, when she's been crying in the toilet. Um, before I bring you in, Aaron, I want to show um, what was potentially the context of Diane Abbott um, crying in a toilet. Now, I mean, it's, it's common knowledge that she received more abuse, racist, sexist, awful, awful abuse um, over the last four years than any other politician in, in Britain. Disgusting stuff. Um, but it is worth checking the dates of when this conversation happened and what was in the news um, on that day or the, or the following day, what was going on that week. Um, so this conversation was going on on the, 18th, on the 8th of March, 2017. I'm going to get up a Guardian article from the 9th, sorry, the 8th of February, 2017. I'm going to get up a Guardian article from the 9th of February, 2017. Headline, conservative officials suspended over racist tweet aimed at Diane Abbott. Um, the context of that tweet, you've got a local con conservative official was suspended from the party for retweeting a message aimed at Diane Abbott that had been, they say, described as racist, but it was, that's, I think that's a bit bad from The Guardian, really. Uh, so he had tweeted portraying Abbott, the shadow home secretary, as an ape wearing lipstick. And he posted, nice lips, kid, but a shade too much rouge. Disgusting. But anyway, this is a quote that I thought was incredibly relevant to what's going on here. Um, so the controversy emerged as it was revealed that a female staff member in Abbott's team wrote to the Metropolitan Police about another threatening and racist message sent this week. Abbott would not comment on the police complaint, which was leaked to The Guardian, but sources confirmed that it had been sent. The worker claimed that death and rape threats and offensive messages focusing on race and weight were now a daily occurrence for the Shadow Home Secretary. So that week, Diane Abbott, her team had had to write to the Metropolitan Police about another um, message which was threatening violence, threatening rape. And obviously, Diane Abbott is quite rightly upset about this. And what do you do as director for campaigns of the Labour Party? You tell a Channel 4 journalist where she's getting her lunch. Leon is, is a cafe, it's a restaurant. So he, he's telling journalists to go and follow Diane Abbott, who's getting more abuse than any other politician in this country, to follow her when she goes for lunch and making jokes when mm. she's upset in a toilet. It's disgusting. It's horrific. It's harassment. It's targeted. It's a targeted campaign of harassment, not by partly by Twitter trolls and the far right and so on, partly by the media. You always want a story. Oh, we, we maybe we can break the shadow home sector as a human being. Of course, far more interesting for them because she's a black woman who has left wing views. Uh, but then it's aided and abetted by people within her own organisation, people who are meant to have her back, people who are paid to have her back. And I, you know, it's just it's remarkable. How dare anybody in the Labour Party say they're the party of anti-misogyny, anti-racism? How dare they? Uh, not even not even a Tory would sink this low. People said, "Oh, will it? I saw Owen Jones make a tweet. This is what the Tories do." No, they don't. The but the Bullingdon Club wouldn't wouldn't do this to their own. Mm. It's absolutely despicable. Not one ounce of loyalty or integrity from these people. Disgusting, malevolent stuff. And you know, it's it. People like hyperbole. People love superlatives. How else would you like to characterize this? Somebody, and this, by the way, this gentleman has an OBE. He has an OBE and he's a director of the Labour Party. And he's telling, not just any old journalist, 
somebody who we know is a very hostile political journalist, at the, I think the time was political editor Channel 4, Michael Crick, to find out where the Shadow Home Secretary is. This person isn't just not welcome in the Labour Party, shouldn't just not work for them. They're an abhorrent human being. They really need to look in the mirror. Well, I tweeted this yesterday, Abby Wilkinson, a journalist and friend of the show. She tweeted under it like, I wouldn't do this to my worst enemy. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like it, political enmity cannot explain this behavior. This behavior is like sociopathic. It's just, and anyway, let's actually, let's go to now Dawn Butler because it obviously wasn't just Diane Abbott. So this is from October, 2016. Emily Old, now again, Dawn Butler. So this is when she's just been, um, I'm sorry, then Neil Fleming, acting head of press and broadcasting. Yep. PLP women will go spare. Emily Old, no. Good grief. Claire Francis Fuller. Did she not accuse the LP and its staff of being racist this week? Nice. Emily Old, no. Harriet White Privilege Harmon. That conversation would look dismissive and ridiculous enough as it is. Um, but given that <laughs> the people in that conversation, in the conversation uh, um, that we, we also now can see, um, were pointing out where the person subject to the most racism of any politician in the country was having lunch so that a journalist could follow them, um, to then think that, you know, Labour Party staff, it would be ridiculous to question whether or not they're anti-racists um, is, you know, more than a little ironic, isn't it, Aaron? But yeah, and also, look, I mean, sometimes you, you have to take stock and you go, you look around the room, you go, oh, wow, we're mostly middle-aged, white people white white guys actually one of the one of the one of the astonishing things in this in this report was emily oldnow who's a woman is repeatedly abusive about other women uh, you know misogyny misogynoir isn't just limited to men you know it can be internalized by women and this is a classic example of that but more horrific is seeing men john stolliday hennigan it's two or three men repeatedly denigrate women carrie murphy was in one diane abbott's another using the most violent language imaginable. Now, when a man uses violent language about women repeatedly, again, it goes beyond a political or a factional point, right? What kind of what kind of psychological mindset is at work here? You know, maybe I don't think this is about left and right, and I'm not trying to win people over to my side of the debate here by you know trying to reach. Uh, it's not ideological. Anybody that uses that kind of violent, aggressive language about women repeatedly, particularly women of color. I think they have significant problems and they certainly shouldn't be working in a progressive party and, and they certainly shouldn't try and uh, dawn themselves the mask of anti-racism. And it's just, again, it's, you know, repulsive. And yeah, I want to just bring up one more to sort of show how this isn't just factional. It's just like, who the who are these people? So this is Emily Aldno again, Graphic 7A, who is, let's remind you, Executive Director of the Labour Party for Governance. So she's the person who's, she's the top dog when it comes to dealing with complaints. She's the, you know, the buck stops with her. Emily Oldno, fuck off pubehead. I'm too busy slagging you off. Mike Creighton, can I just point out from my sickbed that there's too much disparaging talk about old folk on this timeline. Salt of the earth, don't you know? Tracy Allen, who is pubehead? Um, Emily Oldno, to talk to you about John Trickett's diary, Katie. Also, they were talking, they were calling Katie Clark pubehead. Emily Oldno, Katie Clark had the exact same clothes on yesterday. Smelly cow. Tracy Allen, didn't she do that at conference too? Emily Oldno, yes, same clothes, four days. Patrick Kennigan, probably slept in them. Disgusting. Emily Oldno, Carrie is fat too. There's a good old role in that photo. Like this is, I've heard people say, look, this is a WhatsApp chat and people chat shit mm -hmm. on, on WhatsApp chats. And it's, you know, potentially, you know, sometimes I say some things on, on WhatsApp chats that are a bit politically incorrect or something. And, you know, I wouldn't publish it publicly on Twitter. But what the fuck adult? writes this shit because it's not even you know it's not it's not funny like if sometimes if you've got a sort of if you're doing some banter on a on a what on a whatsapp chat and someone says something rude about someone you're like oh well, at least that that was witty oh, i wouldn't say that in public but this is just like these are, are these people 14 no they're executive directors of britain's main progressive party i mean a normal and i know what you're saying and there's a, there is this isn't us trying to oh this is cancel culture this is not cancel culture this is not about there's a distinction between what you would publish uh publish uh, publicly or privately which like you say michael is, is a thing you know on whatsapp i'll be saying oh you fancy this or that person you know this, that's what people do but you would say the same to me you'd say something silly this is I think that's making the WhatsApp chat sound a bit more innocent. Like, you fancy this person. You people no, are like, you, you might be rude about other people, but just not no, in this well, we're not. childish. No, well, I mean, we're we not. don't say anything like this. 
I mean, I might go, God, that guy's fucking ridiculous. I mean, okay, that's everybody does that. But like you say, it's like pubehead. I don't call people fat and ugly, pubehead. It's like, what? I mean, maybe I would have done when I was 14, but then I would have been like... Even then, country, even then, it? people would have been like, 14-year-old Michael, that's really mean. That's mm. really mean. Yeah, pubehead. exactly. Pubehead. I mean, like... And this was, was the person who was... This was a person in charge of how people should behave in the Labour Party. Yeah. Who hasn't moved on from being like a really awful 14-year-old. With an OBE. How Bizarre. does that happen?